Okay, well, uh, for this lecture, we're going to talk about Phyllis Wheatley and also Margaret Fuller. Um, I'm going to talk about Phyllis Wheatley, just one poem. Uh, that's all they've got here. She wrote another poem uh, dedicated to George Washington, too. If you get a chance, you ought to read it because it's quite a good poem. Um, one of the things that we want to take a look at, this is uh, sort of the second, po second poet from the colonial era that we looked at. We looked at Anne Bradstreet. This uh, poet's uh, notable and interesting because she was African-American. And she received some considerable notoriety, sort of like Anne Bradstreet. Uh, and you know, some people say, well, it was because she was a very good poet. Others say, well, more because she was a curiosity. And there's no doubt that she was a curiosity. That's, that's certain. Uh, it was not uh, very uh, uh, common to see a woman as a poet publishing her own poetry at that time, much less an African-American uh, African woman. You need to understand, too, that there was... Um, and by the way, Jefferson didn't think she did have much talent as a poet, uh, of course, Jefferson not known much for his literary criticism. I don't know that I'd go that far. He also hated novels and thought they were trash and would rot your brain. Um, so I'm not sure I would trust his his, uh, his taste on uh, literature. But um, it, it, she had, you know, good talent, I think, as a poet. I don't think I would rank her up there with Shakespeare or someone of that nature. But uh, she was a she was a, a polished poet and a good poet. Uh, but she also was a curiosity of sorts because uh, it was so unusual to see somebody with her background becoming a published poet. Um, I don't think Jefferson's dislike of her was because she was African-American. Although, you need to understand one thing. When you look at a poet... Um, we're going to see this with Harriet Jacobs. We you can see it with anybody like uh, uh, Frederick Douglass or anybody of that nature. Um, publishing the works of a an African American during the time of slavery was itself a kind of subversive act that argued implicitly against slavery. How? It argued against uh, slavery implicitly because it was living proof of their accomplishments. And it is bound to occur to somebody who reads a book of poetry by an African-American woman, it's bound to occur to them to say, why in the world does slavery exist? This woman is every bit as talented as anybody else. Why, you know, for example, if you were to see the handiwork of, of uh, an African-American engineer or architect or um, anybody like that, an inventor, uh, your first question would be, why in the world is this person not being treated like everyone else? They obviously have the talent, the intellect, the ability, the artistic sensibility of anybody else. It, it really is kind of this tacit argument against slavery. So publishing the work is a bit of a subversive thing. Now, not a lot is known about Phyllis Wheatley's life. We do know that she was devoutly religious, very, very religious. We also know, sadly, that she died in poverty. She did... Um, um, become a free woman and married a free black man, um, that she lost children to disease that was very common, and that she died at a fairly young age. But we really don't know an awful lot about her other than that. Um, you know, it's sad, but it's true that not a lot of African Americans at the time, um, not a lot of documents related to their life, their biographies, uh, their genealogy exist. Um, and that's just simply because of the you know, the, the legal condition of, of, of who they were and what they were. Um, it's kind of interesting to speculate how much she would have gone on to become a more famous writer than she already is uh, had she lived. But we do have a book of her poetry, and uh, one of the best ones, and most controversial, I might say, is this one called On Being Brought from uh, Africa to America. I'm going to read it real quickly because it's so quick. "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race, sable means dark, uh, with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes black as Cain may be refined and join the angelic train. Now, this is an interesting poem. First question is, how do we take this poem? Um, she can't be arguing that slavery is a good thing, can she? Well, it doesn't seem so. I don't think anybody would argue, especially if you were a slave, would argue that slavery is a good thing. Um, but when she says, "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too." Wheatley, of course, is a Christian. Um, and what she's basically saying is, were it not for my having been enslaved, I would not have learned about Christ. I would not have become a Christian. And as a result of that, 
I am saved. I am happy to now have a relationship with the, the one true God. Notice this, though. Was it mercy on the part of human beings, or was it God's mercy? Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land. I'm not so sure that she would think that the slave master and the slave owner is the one being merciful here. Well, in what sense would God be said, uh, could, could God be said to be merciful in having brought her in captivity, in, in slavery here? Um, and she says, uh, well, on a spiritual level, certainly. I don't think you can read this, at least not me personally, maybe you can, but I don't think you can read this as sort of, gee, I'm glad I was a slave, gee, I'm glad I'm enslaved, it's really awesome. Um, so is she sincere in saying this? I think she is. Is she saying what we think she's saying, which is, gee, I'm glad to be a slave? I don't think she's saying that. Was she sort of forced Sort to, to to write this right here, Phyllis. Here's a pen. Write a poem, ba basically saying you're glad that you're a slave because at least you're now a Christian. I doubt that highly. I, any you know person that you know was an owner or slave owner who allowed someone like that to write her own poetry probably didn't have a gun to her head while doing it. I just can't imagine that. Was she brainwashed? I don't know, possibly. I mean, if you're brought up to believe that slavery is a good thing, slavery is a natural and normal thing, this is what you belong doing, um, maybe so. But I, I, I like to think that maybe it's a little bit more sophisticated poem than that. You decide on your own, because the latter half of the poem really implies a sort of tacit criticism of those who look down their nose at people of color. And it's a really biting criticism if you think about it. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye, meaning oh, all black people are from the devil, etc. And there was a lot of superstition and all that kind of stuff, and you can imagine, right? Um, remember, she says, now look, this is pretty, this is pretty stern. I think it's very straightforward, and it's pretty bold of her to say this. You know, here is someone who is a slave lecturing white people, right? That takes a little gumption to do that. Remember, Christians, Negroes black as Cain may be refined and join the angelic train. In other words, listen, two things you need to think about. One, um, be careful not to be crit uh, hypocritical, okay? And I think that's who she's pointing this out. You claim to be a Christian, and, and then you, you think other people are not are not are, are beyond salvation. Uh, you better think about that. Secondly, there's nobody, no matter how low born in life, no matter what their condition, whether they're slave or free, who can't receive salvation. And everyone can be refined. She doesn't argue that 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 African Americans need to be refined more than white people. She just basically says even you know black folks doesn't matter um, can be refined just like you can and join the angelic train. And that's the interesting little clause there at the end, and join the angelic train. Guess what? Here, I may be a slave and you may be free, but in the next life, we are all going to be equal. And you better get ready for it, and you better get used to it. It's, 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 it's very subtle, but I think it's in there. Um, you know, it's, it's a reminder that, look, some people may be low condition, high condition, lots of money, no money, free, slave, whatever it is, black, white, whatever it is in this world. But in the next one, everything's going to be even and everything's going to be equal. This world's filled with injustices, but the next world will not be. And you better get ready for it. And you better examine your conscience about how you treat people in this world because it's going to matter how you get treated in the next. So I think it's a, I think it's an interesting poem. I think it has been criticized in the past for having been too tacitly, you know, uh, I should say, too too much um, in accord with slavery, too willing to to go along with the premises of slavery. I don't really I don't really read it that way. I think she had to be careful how she put it, but it, there's a criticism here. I think there's a an independent spirit and strength here to this. Um, it, she I think she's her own woman in the poem. At least that's the way I read it. We'll see what you think.